Yeah, thanks. Hey, everyone. Um, so I actually gave a version of this talk in a Breakpoint in Amsterdam, uh, so 2023. Uh, but it was really focused on, at that time, what could be more theoretically done um, in Solana for kind of making fees more predictable and less volatile. And I think a lot of that stuff has actually started to come to fruition. And I spent a lot of time talking with uh, Max, uh, Max Resnick, who kind of joined uh, Anza recently. And we were just talking about, hey, actually, now is sort of the time that a lot of these kind of things that people were sort of talking about maybe impacting Solana's performance in 2023 are actually sort of practically here today. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. I tried to, to make sure this wasn't too on the technical weed side. And hopefully, if it is, I apologize. Uh, so you know, resource pricing and fees is a very important thing to any blockchain, right? Figuring out how much you need to pay in gas for your transaction, figuring out as an application how much you should be expecting your users to be interacting with your app based on the fees, also important. Um, but what, what, what does resource pricing really mean? So if we consider sort of blockchains and resources, one kind of key important difference is because there's no identity, it's really hard to meter how much I have to charge you because you can replicate yourself and, and spam. Uh, but what are the resources that blockchains have? Um, there's sort of a bunch of different resources. Uh, first, of course, is execution and compute. How much do I pay the validators for actually running uh, the code that's running on these transactions? B, how much should I pay for storage? C, how much should I pay for bandwidth? And D, sort of how do I think about priority or latency? Um, these last two, of course, are sort of things that I think in the Solana ecosystem people have really been focused on. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can use fees to improve those. But again, permissionless systems inherently have to have congestion pricing, where there's pricing based on how much demand there is at a given time versus fixed prices. Uh, generally speaking, it's because I can Sybil attack, I can, I can make clones of myself, uh, and fixed or very low price transactions generally become, it becomes cheaper to spam them to. So this leads you to two questions from an engineering standpoint that are really important to, to think about. The first is, how much should congestion costs actually increase? You know, everyone here has probably gone to DoorDash or Uber and closed the app and reopened it and seen the price go up by a certain amount. And the question is, blockchains are doing that every slot, every block, every transaction. How much should that actually happen? And the second thing, which I think is, has become much more important for Solana, um, and, and I think Max will probably talk a lot more about this uh, later, is which resources should actually share congestion costs um, and which resource resources should be independent of one another. So what do I mean by kind of sharing versus separate? Um, you know, imagine Uber and Uber Eats were both using the same congestion pricing. So you know, on New Year's Eve, when Uber prices are skyrocketing, the price of a burger is also skyrocketing because somehow all the delivery, uh, the, the, the ride, ride hailing is actually causing delivery prices to go up for, uh, for, for food delivery. That's sort of the notion of sharing congestion costs, right? And so for some types of goods, for some types of resources, you may never want to share congestion costs. You may want the burger price to really reflect the demand that people have for McDonald's and not at all you know, people kind of buying Ubers. Blockchains have sort of the same thing. And so you, you could say, hey, should execution and storage be priced the same? Should I be congesting you? you know, if, if, say, an app like Helium is requesting a lot of storage, it's writing a lot of new accounts, should I actually be increasing the execution cost for a DeFi app, or should they be separate? And that, that's sort of the fundamental question here. Picking which resources, again, is, is really important. And you know, the Uber Eats and Uber analogy is kind of the simplest one to think of. OK. So before even kind of defining what, what it means to be a multidimensional fee, let's, you know, one thing that's worth pointing out is what is the main benefit from having these more complicated fee models of like charging a different amount for storage versus charging a different amount for compute? And 
Uh, generally speaking, you can think of the fees as doing load balancing. So you can say, hey, actually right now there's a bunch of demand for storage, so we're gonna make the storage price go up, but the execution price doesn't have to go up because there's not that much demand for it. And in general, that means you can increase throughput and effectively bandwidth through a network in terms of the number of transactions you can uh, successfully land and like sort of the average size of the slot. And so there's been a bunch of studies on that. I'm just kind of showing you just to give you some illustrative examples of how in the top chart, you can see that the volatility in fees goes down with more dimensions. And in the bottom chart, you can show there's just actually larger slots, larger confirmed blocks. Now, there's no free lunch. So let's talk about the trade-offs of doing this. Um, so a natural question is, how do you really formalize what resource usage is? I think this is the only slide I have any equation, so. Uh, uh, so first off, we have some set of resources. This is your execution cost, your storage, your bandwidth, dot, dot, dot. We have some notion of a set of operations. So you can think of these operations as a single opcode in your VM or a single atomic VM operation. Maybe there's some opcode that has side effects, so you need to cons consider some kind of subset grouping of them. Then we have a set of resource limits. So this is you know, how much execution are you willing to do per slot? How much storage are you willing to do per slot? Uh, this is something sort of the network agrees upon. And as many of you saw with the most recent contentious Solana vote for changing uh, the inflation curve, choosing these is not easy in a decentralized network. And finally, you have a weight matrix. And what this says is how much does a particular operation consume of the different resources? So you can think of the, the, the columns of this matrix as representing the amount, each resource, and the rows is representing operation. So maybe the addition operation takes a ton of compute, but zero storage or minimal storage. And finally, a block is just an ordered list of operations. And the way we define a valid block is we say, hey, we count the number of operations that we have. So we, we kind of make this histogram. And then we say the histogram uh, interacting with the multiplied by the weight matrix is less than the limits. OK. So this tells you what a valid block is. This is sort of a, a kind of way of thinking about when you have multiple resources, what does it mean to be a valid block? Because again, the block confirmation rules get more complicated. So what is a multidimensional price? Simply put, it's we just say, hey, here's how much each resource costs at each block height, at each slot height. And the multidimensional fee model takes in those histograms, it takes in the previous prices, and it gives you a new price. The simplest version is I only depend on the last block's demand and prices, and I give you a new price. But you know, that might sound overly simplistic, and the devil's in the details. I, I would say you, know, you, can, you can look to the Soviet Union in the 1950s to see what happens when you choose this function incorrectly. And this is a good book on, on this history. OK. So I'm going to just try to present the, the, the kind of dialectic here of there's good and bad with using multidimensional fees. And we'll talk about in, in shortly where in Solana people are really interested in, in doing this. So the blue pill, if you fix the set of resource groups, like the, you know, what we were talking about earlier of like, oh, maybe execution and bandwidth are priced together, but storage is priced separately. So you fix those groups. Um, you don't actually need to choose this function. You can learn it based on demand that people are um, expressing in the network. So this means you can write an optimization problem and the bunch of, of papers on this. And this is sort of last time what we talked about. What is the optimization problem component composed of? First off, there's sort of what does a user get out of sending their transaction? Then there's some notion of cost to the validators for running this. And then the blocks, of course, need to be valid. And so the idea is they're actually simple, efficient algorithms you can run. And you know, people have already implemented them in a lot of clients in many blockchain networks for solving this problem and giving you fees. The red pill, however, and this is, this is the part I think where, where, where people are thinking about this in, in Solana clients, is picking which groups of resources should be priced together or not 
You know, suppose there's a bunch of demand where execution on the network and RPC nodes are very correlated, so you want to kind of increase fees for both of them together, and then all of a sudden only execution is being used. Maybe that means you want to join the groups, split them up, join them again. This, however, is actually extremely hard. And so Max and others actually should kind of showed a kind of re very recent result, like uh, a couple of weeks ago, that this doesn't work. And it was sort of inspired by them trying to implement this in, in, in a Solana client. And so what this means is, unless you know what resources you want to price ahead of time, it's actually extremely expensive to try to learn how to group them together. So on one side, you have this easy thing. If I knew which resources I want to price individually versus together, I have an easy optimization problem. But if I want to learn how to group them, that is a hard optimization problem. And, and I think in, 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 in some of the, the low latency use cases, this is really bad. Because this actually means, while using multidimensional fees, will increase your bandwidth if you know the resources. It will also increase your latency if you don't, if you have to learn which resources to group together. So that, that's sort of the trade-off surface. So with the last couple of minutes, I will just kind of talk about why I think application should care. First off, uh, and I think this is kind of something probably everyone in the room has, has thought of or seen or you know, you maybe submitted a transaction on January 20th to the Solana blockchain and, and learned this more directly, uh, is effectively the noisy neighbor problem of, you know, certain applications taking up most of the block space, uh, leading to tons of rejections and retries, um, especially when you have this bifurcation between execution applications, which is generally DeFi, and then storage applications, which is a lot of other things. I use Helium as a, a nice example of that because it's a very clear, uses way more storage, but obviously there's a ton of applications on Spectrum. The other thing is, if you notice, there's this huge spread that has, varies over time between sort of the median fees in Solana and the average fees in Solana. And in general, one reason you may want multidimensional fees is this, the gap between the red line and the gray line is minimized, and that's sort of what what the goal is of these kind of methods. The second thing, and I think this is a more recent thing, is that in general, people want to make an analog of an order type, of a unique order type on chain. And I think in the, the version of decentralized NASDAQ that people kind of have been talking about lately, there is certain sets of sequences people want to enforce uh, in an economic manner, such as have all the cancels executed in the block before any of the other orders, like, like for instance, what Hyperliquid does, but also what most TradFi exchanges will do. Um, and this type of stuff is effectively enforcing custom order types in your blockchain. Now, one way of doing that is to get the validators to agree on that as a rule. That's generally a lot harder. Another way is to sort of do it economically, by using fees to encourage the, the cancels to generally be ahead of time. And so that's sort of Max and Anatoly wrote this blog post a couple weeks ago on, on that. But another thing is if you expect a lot of traditional finance assets to come on chain, to be traded on chain, this type of stuff happens. And so um, an example of this is uh, in terms of a custom order type that you want to enforce economically. In the bond market, there is something called a workup. And a workup is when there is a large bond transaction, the market freezes until that transaction has cleared. So suppose a central bank comes in and says, I want to sell $100 billion of treasuries. The market will freeze until 50% of that is sold, and then people can trade freely. And you might say, hey, an application can enforce that. But actually, not really. An application can enforce that up to getting front run. I can't really enforce that that order is the only one that gets fulfilled first. And in general, a lot of the types of stuff you're seeing people in crypto want to do is what you see, what you had in TradFi, except you have to do it economically. And the fee model is usually the best way to kind of encourage these types of things. And with that, I have 19 seconds. So the, 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 there are three things to take away. First, multidimensional fees can increase your throughput and bandwidth in the network. But if you have too many dimensions, you increase latency. And of course, 
if the goal is to, to reduce latency and increase bandwidth, then you know, there's, only, there's kind of a constraint there. And one way to think about this type of stuff is, I, I, I think if you want to tell someone who's in TradFi or Web2, what's the point of these complicated fee models or, or things like that, it's, a, it's just a way of enforcing order types, of making these custom order types that rely on, on relative ordering. And, and I think that seems like people really want to do that. So with that, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.